I got my quorum book right here. I love it. I love it. All right. Not on purpose, but. <laughs> Um, well, thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last session of the day. Um, I know it's that time when everybody is looking for coffee, um, but I, hopefully you won't need it today because this is going to be a really exciting grassroots session. Um, while folks just get logged in for this session, we just want to start you all with an icebreaker in the chat. Um, since we're going to talk about building a grassroots program from scratch, and we're now very much in fall, which is perfect baking season, um, what's everyone's favorite thing to bake from scratch? So go ahead and, hey, Ryan, how's it going? Uh, go ahead and put your favorite thing into um, what you like to bake. I'll go first. Uh, my favorite thing is my family and I always do a, a marathon holiday baking. Um, so we like to bake hundreds of Christmas cookies every year. Mindy, what about you? Are you a baker of any kind? You know, I'm not. I'm gluten-free, so... Oh, that's sort of knocks awesome. everything out. Yes, my sister <laughs> is recently gluten free, and it is very difficult. And also because non like non flour or flour alternatives are expensive. Yeah, you just don't know how they're going to behave. So it yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but after many fails, I just I've just had to move on. <laughs> Okay, we have Shayna who said that she loves to bake babka, which sounds really, really great. Um, oh, and mm. Stephanie just baked a, a batch of gluten-free chocolate cupcakes. That sounds good. That sounds good. Bacon pies. I'm gonna give about one more minute for folks to join. Please feel free to put in the chat your favorite item to bake from scratch. Banana bread, always a favorite of the pandemic. I can't remember if it was SNL or it was something else about banana breads, like PR person winning because of all the banana bread that was baked over the last two years. It was pretty funny. <laughs> awesome. Okay, it's 3.03. So now that folks have had a minute or two to join the session, we can go ahead and get started. Um, throughout the session, feel free to continue to use the chat to ask questions or um, to brainstorm with folks. We're going to take questions throughout, and if a question seems really important for you know our topic, I'll go ahead and ask it um, uh, right away. But then we'll also pause for questions at the end. <clears throat> so, just to introduce everybody here, uh, my name is Hannah Cooper. I'm an account executive at Quorum, uh, but prior to Quorum, I worked in grassroots advocacy for the Distilled Spirits Council, and I'm really excited to be joined by Mindy Barham, who is the government relations manager at Western Governors University. Uh, to discuss how WGU has built, built and rolled out a 50-state grassroots program. Mindy is a seasoned professional with over 25 years of experience serving in administrative, project management, government relations, and compliance roles across a diverse group of industries. Welcome, Mindy. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Hannah. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. We're so excited to have you. Um, so, We'll start with uh, hopefully an easy question. Uh, would you mind just telling us more about your role and about the advocacy work of WGU? Yeah, so um, my role at WGU is a government relations manager. Um, and um, I do have a slide later on that talks deeper about our structure at WGU, but um, and in the government relations manager role, there's two of us, myself and Emily Reiner. And um, we work across all uh, 50 states doing mostly uh, project management and uh, monitoring and intelligence, um, internal liaison work, and that kind of thing. Awesome. Can you tell us um, a little bit more about your, how your team is structured and how you all kind of accomplish um, the advocacy work that you're doing? Yeah, so our team, WGU uh, itself is structured into seven regions. And so with a RVP, a regional vice president, as a lead. And um, within those regions, um, the government relations department reports to the external affairs, the greater external affairs department at WGU. But there's a a government relations person assigned to each region as a point person so that 
they have someone to talk to in government relations, first of all, but we also understand what's going on at the state level, at the local level. Um, who are they talking to? What partnerships are going on? What events are going on? That sort of thing. So um, that's how we've been structured in the past. Um, and, you know, prior to um, COVID, we had folks in all seven regions sort of siloed um, working in their region. And we found that that just wasn't great for our communication. So while we still have to operate in regions because that's how WGU is structured, uh, we're moving more to a integrated role-based um, system so that, you know, some regions have three states, some regions have 13 states. Um, so we all can collaborate, come together, divide and conquer. We're all involved in what's going on in all the states um, rather than being siloed. So that's kind of our um, new structure for the coming year. So I'm pretty excited about it. That's awesome. And based on this structure change, and I think a lot of state government, you know, government teams are used to regions. Um, were there, you know, any immediate benefits that you saw from that change or any challenges from that change as well? Well, we're kind of in the midst of the, the change, but I can say that I, our directors and and, and managers and myself um, actually welcomed that. Um, it was really hard to work, especially because we're all remote, we're all over the country. Um, and so it's not like we go to the office every day and talk. <laughs> um, so using Quorum has helped us to see the bigger picture, mm -hmm. um, be able to look across all 50 states and say, oh, you know, we were able to accomplish that in this state. How did we do that? Can we recreate that? You know, the legislative landscape is similar in this state. Can we, you know, recreate that over here? Yeah. Um, so I think that's helped us to see, like I said, the bigger picture, get out of the silos, um, but still understand that, you know, the regions are doing different things and we can also gain knowledge, um, you know, and insight uh, you know, maybe the West region is doing something really innovative and we want to apply that to the South region or something like that. So, um, you know, I think both ways are good um, for different reasons, but I'm excited to kind of broaden um, and to be able to work across the, the lines and not be so stuck in, you can only work in this region. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Especially when there are really great opportunities for learnings from other states um, and other advocacy efforts. Do you want right. to follow up um, with that question on why does it even like make sense for your team to focus on state-based advocacy? Um, because the work that we do is, it, our team is called government relations, but we're really state relations. So there is a team within WGU that works at the federal level with higher education, with Pell Grants and that kind of thing. Um, but we're working down at the state level um, because um, mostly because we're working on partnerships at the state level and we're working on opening up channels of grant and aid at the state level. And um, that needs to be done with state advocacy. Got it. And with, you know, and, you know, your team started a pilot program for a few key states to um, focus on that advocacy. Um, can you kind of walk us through that? Um, and I would love to know, in addition to that, not to hit you with like two questions at once, um, and maybe this is a part of it, but kind of what were the key factors in deciding which states would be a pilot? So we pulled the government relations directors and we asked them, um, okay, each of you can pick two states in your region that you feel are um, priority areas for us. And so each of them picked a couple of states and we decided to do an internal pilot uh, with our employees first. So for a couple of reasons, one, we did some special coding to our website and we just wanted to make sure that everything was running properly. Um, and two, we wanted to get some user experience feedback from our employees before it went to external facing folks. Um, and three, 
our uh, our staff works closely with students and alumni, and we wanted to hear back from them on what they thought, um, because that's kind of our two core groups that we're going to be targeting with this program. So we wanted to know what their thoughts were. Um, you know, would our students have time to do this? Would they be interested in this? Um, is there any changes that you would recommend since you work with students day in and day out, that kind of thing? Interesting. And so, uh, you know, what did you, I understand that you kind of had these parameters and reasons. Um, what did you learn from the pilot group? Um, and then I did also have a follow-up question of, you know, if share kind of having your own pilot group with your employees um, help to showcase your government relations efforts, even just internally. So um, the the pilot went well, considering we did, there was not a lot of foreknowledge. Um, we sent an email out in advance so that people would understand it wasn't spam or anything like that. Um, and it did take us a couple of reminders. Um, it, I think it showed us that people are interested um, and willing, um, but it takes some time and it takes a lot of um, outreach um, on a regular basis and telling people what you're doing and why and why they should care. And WGU is such a mission-driven organization. Um, we have a lot of people that work here are very passionate about our students and higher education. And so you just need to get them on board. <laughs> um, so creating the program was not enough. Um, I think you know we learned that in the pilot, even though it performed really well, um, it gave us that knowledge of, okay, you know, this is like a starting point. Um, for us to understand and improve, you know, going forward. Um, and after the pilot program, you know, we expanded it to six priority states. And now this year um, we're expanding it to all 50. And partially that is because it really was already operating in all 50. Um, we don't operate in a silo at WGU. We have students, alumni and staff in all 50 states. And, um, you know, we started to talk about this program and it was organically people were coming to our action center and joining. So we actually have um, people in 37 states already. Um, so it's more of, OK, you know, how do we, um, you know, group the states in such a way that we can say these 10 states are in this phase, these are in this phase, um, and craft a message that we can tweak slightly so that we're not creating 50 messages because we can't do that. Um, our team is too small and nobody has time probably to do that. So how can we group like states together, send um, messages quickly? Um, so those are some things we're working on, creating a library um, of, campaigns where if we're trying to, you know, this these legislators need to know the WGO 101. We pull that campaign, we tweak it a little bit if it's a student or alumni sending it, and then, you know, we send that off, followed by, okay, now they've moved into a different category. They know who we, we are. We need to educate them about what we do and so forth. And we're moving them on down through the funnel in all 50 states, potentially, depending on our advocates and where they're signing up and what they're willing to do. Um, but we're using Quorum to um, track where they are in the funnel um, and also to automate some of that so that we're not overwhelmed um, with crafting tons and tons of messaging. That's great. I did want to, um, I, I thought it was really, really helpful how you kind of described that funnel and how you were, you were, you know, bringing folks to recognize your grassroots program at WGU and um, trying to organize them into the ladder of engagement to get more quality uh, grassroots actions from them. 
Um, I did want to follow up and just ask, you know, in terms of what you learned from the pilot group, did you find that user behaviors differed between states and how they interacted with your action center or based on issues that folks were taking action on, you know, were there any differences in how different groups responded to your messaging or action center or um, any fi findings, other findings that you found from your pilot group? Yeah, so um, in the, the pilot group, we just had um, employees and the message was WGU awareness. So it was like, you know, I work at WGU, we have this many students from your state, you know, that kind of messaging. Um, and then when we moved to uh, students um, and alumni, and we had different messaging. Um, so we had uh, states where we were trying to open up that channel of access to equitable access to state financial aid. Um, our students jumped all over that because they can benefit right away. Whereas our alumni was like, mm, you know, I want to give back, but you know, it's not the same. And so um, that was something we worked on the latter part of this year is how can we get our alumni uh, more involved in our advocacy efforts? Um, and so we uh, started going to some events. Uh, we host commencement events across the United States for our graduates to attend. So we started to go there we had a booth and we were talking to alumni, letting them know what we're doing. And um, that was very helpful because, um, you know, they simply just didn't understand uh, what we were doing and why they should care. Um, but when they understood that, um, oh, I could have, I could have had financial aid in the state and I didn't because of this outdated notion, you know, yeah, I'll help other students. Yeah, I'm in, you know, so that was helpful to understand, um, to tweak the messaging a little bit. Students get it. Um, alumni, we need to hook them a different way. Um, and then employees, they get it because they deal with students all the time that are heartbroken because, mm -hmm. you know, they need that financial aid um, in order to continue their degree program or something like that. So, so yes, um, we did notice some differences um, in in our messaging and and that's something that we're working on this year is to um, craft the different messaging for the different audiences. Got it. We do have a question um, coming in from the chat that kind of relates to messaging um, from Tamika. Um, how can we have a successful grassroots campaign within specific states? We struggle with getting groups on board. Um, could it be our messaging? Should we send multiple emails? Um, and Mindy, just based on kind of what we've talked about so far, was just curious if maybe you had any insight into this. Um, and I guess the only, Tamika, if, if you can put it in the chat, maybe I guess my follow-up question would be, um, you know, are you trying to target specific groups of folks within those states? Um, but Mindy was curious if you had any insight. I was just reading it. Yeah, I mean, with WGU, I'm not sure about your organization, Tamika, but with WGU, we initially focused our grassroots program on you're affiliated with WGU in some way. So you're a student, you're alumni, or you're an employee. Um, and so, you know, we thought that those groups, like I said, they, they should be passionate about WGU, and they are. But education policy is, you know, they came to WGU to get their degree um, and better their life, not talk about education policy. So I think one of the things that we're going to be working on is um, uh, smart brevity, something that Axios talks about. So, you know, your writing doesn't need to be let me tell you about this education policy and all of these fancy words. And, you know, like they don't want to hear that. They want to hear what are you talking about and why you don't have access to state financial aid because of this. And we'd like you to let your legislator know. So, so, I mean, 
that's that's kind of our goal. I mean, we're an academic organization, so we write everything like an academic organization, and that's not the way to do grassroots. Um, yeah. So that's something we're changing and hoping to get more um, participation. Is okay. to keep it keep it short, bullet points. What are you saying? What are you asking me to do? Mm -hmm. Why should I care? Absolutely. I was just going to say that exact same thing, Mindy. So I won't <laughs> I won't repeat that. But I found when I was doing grassroots that the most successful communications were short. Um, where you know the ask was bolded and at the front at the top right away. And that's true for your advocacy communications that are going to your advocates, and then of course the communications that are going to the elected official. Um, just make sure it's very clear why it's important to them and why they should take action. Um, do you want to, I want to keep going um, and talk about now that your program is going to be in all 50 states, um, how are you approaching your efforts? And I'd love to, you know, we've kind of talked a little bit about how you're funneling um, advocates kind of through your ladder of engagement to engage with them, but um, kind of how are you approaching your efforts now and how are you grouping your advocates? Well, that's something we're just starting the process now. So we literally went state by state um, and created um, within quorum in a sheet um, using custom fields, um, all of the things that matter to us in the state. Um, and then that gave us a picture of all 50 states in one place. And then we could also you know, sort them by category. Um, and that allowed us to understand, okay, in these states, we're talking about legislative action. So that, you know, we're going to say those are our priority states. And there's something like 13 of them or something. Um, so, you know, what kind of legislative action is going to go on there? Do we need to engage grassroots to get that done? Or are we, do we have a direct line to the governor and we can just have a meeting and, you know, get something signed? Like, you know, what is the process? Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now is we've identified the states um, this year that we want to be focused on. Um, and how are we going to build our digital advocacy and grassroots campaigns around those priority states, them being priority, but then also the next tier, because at any time those can pop up <laughs> into the um, first tier, right? Um, you just don't ever know how a door is going to be opened and you have to pivot quickly. Um, yep. You have to be agile. So, um, you know, the idea is um, with the introduce, educate, um, engage, and remind is um, an introduced state. They don't know who WGU is. Um, and so we're talking to them about who WGU is. Um, and we're, you know, at the very beginnings. Um, and then once we do that for a little while, we feel like, okay, now we've moved into the education phase. Let us tell you what we're doing. Um, and the specific reasons why WGU is different and that kind of thing. And then when we get to an engage point, that's when we're, you know, ready to run legislation or something's going to happen legislative wise. Um, and so that might be, you know, okay, we need to mobilize our grassroots. We need to start, you know, sending take actions, you know, and then so we accomplish our goal then they go into a remind phase of, um, you know, just want to let you know WGU is here. We're doing these things in the state, um, you know, so that they remember that we're still around and we're still doing good things. So that's kind of the, the cycle. Um, and then we're using that to measure our um, progress. So how many states were we able to move out of introduce and into educate um, or, you know, that kind of thing. 
Um, and then within there, you know, we have, like I said, we have different messages to, um, to legislators from these different groups. So there's, very, there's a bunch of different tiers. And, and like I was saying before, the goal is to group those um, you know, here's, here's the messaging for students. Here's the messaging for alumni. Here's the messaging for employees. It's very similar. Only it says, you know, I'm a student at, I'm an alumni at, I'm a, an employee at, um, and maybe something different for, you know, alumni. Like I was able to, um, you know, get a better career because of my degree at WGU. Like the story is a little bit different. So crafting all of those things into with those um, four categories in mind so that we can quickly pull, um, like I was saying, being agile and oh, the state, something's going on here. We need to be able to pull those messages, quickly tweak them and then be able to send those out. So. Um, last year, we spent a lot of time, um, you know, putting the program together, building out our action center, um, you know, selling it to leadership, that kind of thing, and testing it, learning, um, understanding. This year, it's like, okay, now we get it. <laughs> um, we think this is the way that we can best serve all 50 states um, without hiring a bunch of people or, I mean, WGU is a nonprofit organization. And so we have to be very careful with our money because that money is student dollars for tuition that we're spending. So we try to do most of our work internally as much as possible. Got it. And I did want to ask a follow-up question. Um, we've talked a lot about flexibility, um, which I complete, I, I think everyone um, here can agree that flexibility is um, highly necessary for any grassroots advocacy campaign. Um, but then it can be difficult with also making sure you're staying consistent with messaging. Um, and then understanding that you kind of have an added uh, I don't want to say tier just because we you've talked about tiers, but kind of an added um, uh, consideration of having different groups of folks that you're reaching out to. Um, did you run into issues with trying to balance staying flexible with campaigns, um, but then also trying to balance your messaging? Um, I would say yes. I mean, we had to draw a line last year and say, um, unless we're running legislation um, where we cannot engage grassroots. And there was a lot of times where, you know, we wanted to, if we had, you know, the staff, maybe we could have, um, but we wanted to be able to focus on those states and do those states well. Um, so, you know, I think our messaging, um, what we tried to do with our messaging was tone it down from policy wonk talk to, um, did you know that you weren't, that you weren't um, eligible for state financial aid simply because WGU is 100% online and your state requires a physical presence? That's it. That would get people, what? Um, so, you know, I would say we did that a lot. Um, I haven't tried the AB messaging within Quorum, but I'm excited to do that. Um, we did that a lot with our own campaigns. Um, let's write a student campaign this way and see what happens. Um, and then we'll write another one this way and we'll see, you know, which one performs better um, or which one is resonating. So we, we were able to be flexible with our messaging and, and change some things on the fly, um, you know, based on, you know, this just isn't resonating, especially with, I mean, I think our biggest um, obviously glaring issue was um, alumni doesn't care so much about opening access to state financial aid because they've graduated. So, um, you know, how do we, 
how do we either hook them in or you know try to try to appeal to them when they're graduating and they still have that um, you know excitement and heart for WGU and and want to give back and you know that sort of thing um, or do we use alumni in a different way do we use them in a workforce development um, campaign kind of way is that the best way to um, use their advocacy power. Yeah. Um, another another question, and we've talked we've talked you know about this obviously, and you've just mentioned how you can engage your alumni in a different way. But are there any other ways um, that engagement for each tier looks different, um, or do you engage different tiers, um, you know, differently throughout the year? Can you kind of talk through? Um, either what your communications plan looks like or any just key differences between the groups? Well, initially, like I said, we just um, finished up this exercise not that long ago. So we're in mm -hmm. the midst of designing our campaigns at this point. Um, and so, uh, like I said, I, we envision the introduced campaigns to be more uh, of a WGU 101 kind of feel um, mm -hmm. and some basics about, about WGU um, that were in their state. We, I mean, we've got an election coming up. There's a lot, there's gonna be a lot of new legislators. Um, they're not gonna know who we are. They're gonna get a lot of emails from other folks. Um, so um, that's something we're working on um, is getting in a congratulations on your election email situated um but it's you know it's an introductory note which you know it does it is different between states so some of our states are are what we call state affiliates so um, we have an mou or an agreement at some level that allows our students to access that state financial aid that doesn't mean that legislators know who we are mm -hmm. um especially new ones and so the messaging is a little bit different for those states. Um, hi, we're WGU. This is what we do. We're in your state. We've been in your state X years. Um, you know, here's our, um, here's the stats um, in your state versus a state that's, that we don't have a partnership with. Um, the messaging would be something like, um, you know, hey, we're WGU. We partner with states. Here's some examples of other states where we've helped in uh, workforce development and, you know, that kind of thing. So it does depend on, there's several columns in our um, state of the states is what I call it. Um, and, you know, we're just getting to that point of looking at all of those states and where they fall and what message that we think is gonna resonate um, in each of them. Got it. Um, can you, I, I guess, can you expand and I, I, can you kind of expand on the state of the states? Actually, I love the way that that's phrased. And um, is that, do you, where does that live? Does that live like in a spreadsheet or how does that work? Well, it lived in a spreadsheet for a little while until I put it in quorum. <laughs> so um, I initially put it in a spreadsheet just so that we could, um, you know, fill in the blanks. Like I said, we're, we're fully remote. And so um, having everybody call in and just, we just went state by state. Is this a state affiliate? Yes, no. Do we have an MOU? Yes, no. Do we have grant aid available to our students? Yes, no. Um, are we talking with the governor? Yes, no. Are we talking to legislators? Yes, no. So we have all these categories um, that are important to us that help us decide, you know, okay, if this is straight nose, well, it's probably not a goal state for us this year. Doesn't mean we're not doing anything there. It doesn't mean we can't have our grassroots network uh, send awareness messages or introduction messages. It just means we're not going to do the full court press of all hands on deck and full grassroots and everything in that state. So that is, yeah. that's how Sorry, it started. 
I set up the states as issues within quorum. Um, so each state has an issue, which is also helpful for us on our action center because I can toggle on, show this on the action center and that state will pop up. And so our vision for this year is um, to build out all of the state profiles. And then um, on the way how the Quorum Action Center works, have you know the state on the left hand side, you know, California. Here's what we're doing in California. Here's all of the work that needs to be done in California. Here's our goals in California. And then on the other side is all the take actions you can participate in. So write a letter, call, post this on social media, you know, whatever it is. So you can go right to your state. And you know, I live in California. I pull down California. I look, I see what we're doing there. I participate in the campaigns I want to and, you know, move on with life. So that's where we're trying to get to. Um, it's about a quarter of the way built out. So, and the reason we did that is because the homepage of Quorum, um, the take actions section is kind of small and we didn't want to have 50 states where you had to scroll through and look and we didn't want people advocating outside of their state. Mm -hmm. um, and we felt like that was too confusing, at least up front for our advocates. Um, and so it made better sense for us to build out these state pages and just direct people go to your state. We did get some user feedback saying, um, there's never anything for me to do because the take ac action box was, was blank all the time. Um, so we want to direct people to their state and then put those campaigns in the, in the states, um, you know, send out these introduction campaigns. Great. And then use gamification. Awesome. Now send out these educate campaigns. Great. Now send out these um, engage campaigns or, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Got it. That is a really, really helpful overview. Thank you so much. That just like helped me kind of organize that in my mind. So that's on, first of all, it sounds like a great way to organize a grassroots program. And before we kind of get to our next section here, which um, I want to ask a few questions about how you worked this grassroots program internally, but I will also quickly say that um, when I was at Discus doing a, a 50 state grassroots program, we worked with um, different groups, state by state, kind of local guilds, and we would also have them sign an MOU so that they would understand kind of what they were agreeing to um, to to partner with us on a grassroots advocacy um, effort and just make sure we got their buy in immediately to say like, yep, we know this is a thing and we're going to participate in your program. Um, OK, so I do want to go into kind of internally. What rope did you run into any roadblocks? Um, in building this program at all? Um, we did run into some roadblocks. Uh, we had talked about building a grassroots program before COVID and WGU leadership was very concerned. Our students population, a lot of them are in an underserved category. Um, they're working, they're married. Um, they're, they have competing priorities. They're not the 18 to 25 year olds at the brick and mortar full-time mm -hmm. student. Um, and so our goal obviously is for our students to study and graduate. Um, so there was some concern that we might put some undue burden on our students. Um, but when COVID hit and we were not able to travel, um, I, it became very clear that WG was sitting on this untapped resources of our, you know, 130,000 plus students, 268,000 graduates, um, and 7,000 employees, um, all sitting at home, um, wanting to have their voice heard um, and wanting to be included in um, financial aid conversations and other education policy areas. And so, um, that was the spark that um, allowed WGU to take um, the reins and start this grassroots program. Um, and honestly, when, when we started building it out and talking to our internal stakeholders, um, it, it created 
quite a buzz. And we got a lot of, what is, what is this quorum? What is this grassroots? Um, we didn't mean to do that, but it was actually, I recommend maybe just kind of talking about it on the side in your organization. <laughs> Um, because by the time we presented the grassroots roadshow, I called it, where we had developed everything and we just presented it to the high level groups to get buy in, people were like, yes, sounds great. Let's do it. That's awesome. And did you find with doing the internal grassroots roadshow um, that because you had gotten internal buy in, did you have like internal champions you could lean on if you ever ran into a roadblock um, or? Like for example, I would I would kind of do the same thing. I would I would um, show our grassroots program internally, and if I ever needed like to connect with an advocate or a group who I wanted to engage, I could go to one of my colleagues who maybe had a better relationship with them, and they were already signed in, and I could ask for help. Did you find anything similar um, with just letting you know, kind of doing a little internal education on the importance of grassroots? Yes, I mean absolutely. So the um, you know, the alumni especially, um, we're working much closer with them um, in our events and trying to find, um, hey, do you know a student that fits, you know, this category or we need a student to talk to a legislator about this? Do you know, you know, so we're able to, through those relationships, um, you know, and students as well. So we were able to build relationships with the student facing organization, the program mentors within WGU, um, you know, so that if we were looking for, you know, we really need a student that can talk about, um, you know, being a single mom and this was the only solution for them or, you know, a, a rural student that lived three, three hours away from any college. <laughs> this was the only solution for them, you know, so sometimes we need those to show legislators um, so that those internal relationships helped us to be able to go out and, you know, it helped, um, they would come to us as well. You yeah. know, do you have anybody in your grassroots network that can speak to this or told a story about that or, you know, so it's helped us to be more collaborative internally for sure. That's great. That's always the best too, is especially when I think a lot of folks in general kind of have questions or are unsure about um, different relations or even grassroots advocacy. So um, I think getting internal buy-in is always great um, just to further that education and then helps with buy-in externally as well. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say, you know, we went down the path of um, when we formed our work group, we went down the path of what are all the possible concerns? What, you know, what are, what are the concerns going to be um, or what we thought might come up or what we've heard in the past and then mitigated those somehow. Um, you know, we went to our data department and had them talk to quorum um, and certify that the data is safe and protected and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we worked with the legal department to make sure that we were compliant with our program in all 50 states. We worked with, so that by the time we presented that for buy-in, we were very prepared and very confident. Um, you know, and it, I think leadership felt like, okay, you know, this isn't just something these folks were doing on the fly. They've really spent some time researching and thinking about this and, um, you know, looking at potential risks and complications and how we might, you know, not experience those by addressing that up front, you know. Gotcha. And I do want to get um, to one final question. Um, thank you so much for that overview, especially internally. Um, and this is actually a similar question, but one final question before we open it up to everybody else for questions. So I say that as a warning, would love to see some more questions coming through at the Q&A. I know folks have questions um, on Mindy's great work. So just my final question, um, what does success look like for this program? Um, are you tracking any metrics or milestones to kind of help prove the efficacy of this program and why it should continue? 
So we're tracking the, you know, every campaign that we do and the emails that we send out. Um, and we're tracking if we're moving people through that funnel. So that's kind of the main three. And, and are we, are we attracting people to our program? Um, are we um, getting people to take action when we want them to? Um, I think that was probably our biggest hurdle. We had a lot of people sign up, um, a lot of people open emails, a lot of people click, um, and our take action rate was lower in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases. Um, so if we could increase our take action rate to um, the benchmark rate, that would be, that would be awesome. Um, but that's our main goals. So we're looking at you know, how are these campaigns performing um, mm -hmm. with our advocates? Um, are we getting people to sign up? Are we getting people to take action? Are we moving states through the funnel? Um, you know, that's, those are our top metrics. That's great. And um, a follow-up, a related follow-up question from Shana is, how do you receive and evaluate feedback among the metrics that you just mentioned, um, you know, feedback on, on the program from your stakeholders? Um, meaning our advocates or leadership or? Um, I guess we can do both. It sounds like, I think, I think advocates. Uh, but I think both would be helpful. So, I mean, one of the things that we did that was hugely helpful because we're a small team is we set up a government relations at wgu.edu email box. So when I send out emails, um, they might be from me, they might be from another government relations person. On the back end, I send replies to government relations at wgu.edu. And any one of our team members can go in there and field those and answer those questions. So that takes the um, heat off of you know, one person. For example, when we were working in California last year, it was very busy with a lot of advocates in California. We had a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. And the government relations director was constantly traveling and meeting with legislators and you know, she just didn't have time to answer all of these questions. Um, and most of them were similar, which helped us refine our messaging, by the way. <laughs> um, so that was one way that we um, received um, feedback and, and evaluated was, you know, we're getting a lot of the same question here. Maybe we need to address that in our messaging. Mm. Um, and then having that group email box was helpful to take the um, burden off of one person. And then um, from the leader side of things, WGU is a very innovative, lifelong learning culture organization. Um, they know we're not going to grow this thing in a year. And so They've been very interested to um, expand what we're doing um, and iterate. So um, there's not, you know, we're not doing anything completely crazy, um, but there's no hard and fast, well, you know, it's got to be this or it's got to be that. Now, me personally, I'm always looking at those benchmarks. And if they're way below, I'm concerned you know, like something's, something's not right there. Um, we haven't any had anything significantly low. We did do a couple of experiments last year with targeting the some college and no degree population that doesn't know WGU just because we were just wondering, you know, does that group care about some of the issues that we're working on? Or is that worth is that path worth going down? Um, and those were pretty low rates um, to begin with, but I do think there was promise there in that, um, you know, you've got to hit people seven times before they pay attention um, kind of thing. And so, so yeah. 
Got it. And then a follow up question on that. Um, and I thought I thought that was a great response and it and it reminded me of a few things, but we do have a follow up question on that note. And it's how do you solicit feedback? So outside of folks being able to email your government relations email um, or ask, you know, asking leadership for feedback, how do you solicit that feedback from folks? Um, we are planning to do a user experience survey um, with our, we have a group within WGU that handles those kinds of things, um, you know, because we're always wanting to make sure that our students are satisfied and that employers are satisfied with our students and that kind of thing. So that's something on our list um, is to create a, um, a user experience survey. Um, I would like to hear, um, you know, things like, I, I, you know, I'd like to participate, but I don't understand, or I don't have time, or, you know, even more questions like, how much time can you spend on, on advocacy um, and have, you know, different levels or something like that. Um, I've got a couple of surveys written out um, that I'd like to poll our folks with, but um, we needed to get our state of the states uh, situated first. So, so that was our first priority, but I'd love to hear how other people are soliciting feedback outside of um, email, uh, surveys, that kind of yeah. thing. Absolutely. Yeah, folks, um, I did want to say to uh, Mindy and I were talking beforehand, and if folks have any ideas that they do at their own organizations, um, you know, either for a 50 state grassroots strategy or how you solicit um, feedback uh, or gauge success, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, and Mindy, I will add, I'm trying to think of other things that I did grassroots wise. We definitely had um, at both of my roles, you know, we had an email that folks could use that was like a team email to answer questions. Um, we did also, like internally for my team, I would send out, you know, weekly reports just so that they would be kept updated on how our grassroots was performing. Um, and then we would also host uh, quarterly calls for our advocates to join. So they like if they just wanted to join and be kept updated on the, the specific work we're doing, they could. Um, and then one last thing I'll say is that with our state groups, I actually had a um, kind of an advisory committee from each state. So they could kind of be the leaders of their state and they could tell me uh, within their industry and they could tell me what they liked, what they didn't like and whether they wanted to do in that state as well. Yeah, I mean, we have talked about um, using the Outbox tool to do like a drag and drop newsletter, either mm -hmm. not sure that we have the resources to do it by state, um, but we might pilot that in a couple of regions and see if that is how that's received. Um, so we might be able to solicit some feedback um, from that. But, you know, I think our our challenge is, um, you know, we're trying to do a couple of things. We are trying to, it's hard to do it on a regional level because states are so different. So we can't say in this region, this is what it's, you know, it doesn't work that way. It's state by state. Um, so, but we might, I mean, we have thrown that idea around. Um, we do like the newsletter mm -hmm. feature in Quorum um, and we use it for other things. Um, we haven't tried using it for grassroots, but that's a good idea actually. Yeah, and I think that, you know, to your point, I think that anything that makes sense to share with your advocate network um, can kind of help solicit that feedback um, as well. Uh, so I, that's kind of vague, but I'm just, you know, to what you're saying, Mindy, in terms of using a newsletter, um, but just giving your advocates a source of truth on the issues that you're working on and that you want them to engage on so that you're seen kind of as like the first group that they're going to go to when they want to learn about the specific issues that you're advocating for. Um, so I think that can always be helpful. And then when you're kind of seen as a source of truth, um, a lot of times I think that drives engagement and um, so it's like so helps with soliciting feedback as well. 
Well, and I think too, um, something else that we had thrown around as an idea was um, we're, we're constantly doing partnerships um, on a national level, but also on a state level. And so um, when there's a press release about a partnership, um, you know, sending that out to our advocates, hey, did you know that WGO is partnered with Amazon or mm. Walmart or McDonald's or whatever it is, um, Sheets. Um, and we felt like, you know, not only does that tell your advocates we're doing things in your state, um, but that could also be a way of um, letting legislators know, like having mm -hmm. our advocates send out so we're informing two people at one time. We're saying, hey, advocates, guess what? Um, you know, we have this great partnership. Why don't you tell your legislators about it? Yeah, absolutely. On that note, too, and as a follow up question, just with um, and I will we I'll, I'm going to ask one more question. And so we may not have time. But if you have a question, get it in now. Um, but one last final question. Um, on that note in terms of engaging lawmakers on the grassroots advocacy work you're doing. How do you coordinate, do you coordinate at all with any traditional lobbying efforts to help your grassroots engagement? So, um, you know, if, if you have folks who are going to meet, you know, with people, with elected officials in person, do you kind of coordinate efforts there so they know the grassroots work you're doing? That's what we're trying to get to. So the whole purpose of grassroots initially was, you know, we spend the first 13 minutes of a 15 minute meeting talking about who WGU is and all the misperceptions and debunking those. And, you know, and we have like two minutes to talk about actual policy. So what we're really trying to do with grassroots is have our, the most passionate people that we have, our students, alumni and staff have them constantly be sending those messages so that when our direct lobbying, our government relations folks come in, um, they, they already know who WGU is. Oh, I've been getting your emails, you know, from my constituents. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that you have this different model. That's great. Love it. You know, um, so to have that bigger network of, at the time that we started grassroots, it was like 400,000 people of alumni students and employees. So, and that was for all 50 states. Um, but to have that larger group open the door for us with easy messaging, um, you know, that they could send out, um, that our GR directors could follow up with um, in person and hopefully get to the point of more policy talking by the time they get there. So that was the, yeah, great. that's a goal of ours. Um, you know, we, and we've used it somewhat for that, but last year, you know, we, we got it up and running. It was COVID. We had legislation. <clears throat> we were doing a lot of take actions. Yep. Um, and so I we, know. Are, we are focused there, but this year is more of a, um, you know, we're, we're, things are a little bit calmer um, for us. And so, I think we'll have more of an opportunity to do that, especially in the tier two states where, um, you know, we don't expect anything to happen there this year. Um, so we're going to be monitoring, you know, are we by dripping these campaigns via our advocates, is that working for us? Um, are we getting phone calls? Are we getting meetings? Um, are constituents getting phone calls and emails? Um, that kind of thing. Got it. That is an amazing overview. Thank you so much for your time today, Mindy. This has been incredible. We're one minute to the hour. Um, so I do want to end here, but thank you for going over in detail your 50 state strategy. And then as well, um, talking about how you work internally with your team, um, get buy-in and then show the, the value of your grassroots work. It's really important. So thank you so much again. Thank you. Happy to be yeah. here. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Mindy. And thank you all for joining us for our last session of Wonk Week for today. Um, tomorrow, we're going to kick off our last day with trivia at 1030 a.m. 
followed by a fantastic session from Michelle Urbayi of, Mar of Mary Kay, and then as well, Suzanne Swink of BP discussing the overlap between government relations and corporate affairs at 11 a.m. Uh, so we'll see you then, and thank you again, everybody, for joining.